stumbled apart from the fear of God. In other words, there are hearts that are harder than mountains, no matter what they are exposed to of revelation, they will not change. Next. <clears throat> the first preservation of the Quran, because this always comes with previous scriptures, how do we know that what we have is what was revealed? In the Quran itself is a verse which we will come to where God says that we are the one who revealed it and we will preserve it. However, God made arrangements through human beings to preserve it. And the Quran was memorized at the time of the Prophet Muhammad because I told you they had phenomenal memories. They would hear it. They would memorize it. Of course, the first one was the Prophet Muhammad himself. When it used to be first, because it was coming in, in pieces, he used to rush his tongue because he was afraid he would forget it. Then God revealed a verse saying, don't rush your tongue. You are not going to forget it. We are going to make sure you remember it. And when he used to come to his companions, his disciples, they used to, some of them used to write it down because they were scribes, but the majority of them memorized them, both men and women. So in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, there were many people who could recite the Quran from the beginning to the end by memory. And today we have millions of people, even many people in Western Massachusetts who could recite the Quran, the entire Quran from the beginning to the end. Okay, this is one of the miracles of the Quran, including the majority of people who, if you take the percentages, are those who do not speak Arabic language. It was also preserved in writing, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And the way the recitation went, a person would get an ijaza, which is a permission and a certification from their teacher, that this person can now teach and has the Quran exactly. So you would have a chain. For example, my teacher has 29 people between himself and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Some of them have 37 people, some are in between, depending on who your teacher was. So I learned it from him. He was certified by him. He was certified by him. He was ultimately going back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So anywhere in the world you go, no matter what language they speak, you go in Indonesia, they will recite the Quran the same way as the Arabs do. In India, it will be the same. In China, it will be the same. So that's how the Qur'an was preserved, but it was also preserved in writing. And this is that verse which says that God has, been, has said that he is the guardian of this and he will preserve it. Now we'll talk briefly about the compilation and verification that in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, as we said, there were many people who memorized the Qur'an. In fact, one great tragedy occurred, there were they were enemies to the message, and they pretended to have accepted Islam. They came to the Prophet Muhammad and said, send us some teachers of the Quran. So the Prophet Muhammad sent them 70 people who had memorized the Quran to teach those tribes. And they were ambushed on the way, and all 70 of them were killed. So there were things like that that were happening. So there were scribes who were writing them down at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, besides being in the memory of people. But in his lifetime, it was not compiled together in writing. Okay. The arrangement of the Quran is also divine. People say, why is this here and why is that? Because there were some early revelations in the beginning, some early revelations in the end, some longer uh, verse, uh, chapters in the beginning, some shorter in the end, a short one is in the beginning. So if you look at it, it looks random, but there is divine wisdom behind the arrangement. It was done by God, instructing angel Gabriel and instructing the Prophet Muhammad. So that's how the Quran has always been. After the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, passed away, his first successor, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, uh, was confronted with a lot of uh, wars. And in some of these, 
Many in one of those battles called the Battle of Yamama, 200 uh, huffaz of, of guardians of the Quran were martyred. So one of his advisors, the next caliph, who was Omar ibn al-Khattab, came to him and said, we have to preserve the Quran in writing because so many people are being killed, we might lose it. And the first response of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is no. He said, what the Prophet didn't do, how can I dare to do? But then he was convinced that you better do this, otherwise we may lose it. So they then uh, commissioned a person by the name of Zaid bin Thabit, who himself was a personal scribe of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and told him, we want you to gather all of this together in one place. And he had the same objection, but then he was convinced to do that. And the way he, he verified this is he made an announcement to the city that everyone who has any writing of personal writings of the Quran, bring them. And he gathered the people who had memorized the Quran. And he required two witnesses for every scroll that people had written that there had to be two witnesses that they had heard that exactly from the mouth of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So every verse was verified and he put it all together for the caliph. And then after, so it was together, not in a book form, but in writing. It wasn't bound together. And after the, Abu Bakr, who was only al alive for two years after that, passed away, then it went to the next caliph. Then it was kept in the custody of his daughter, who was a wife of the prophet. Her name was Hafsa. And then finally, the, the third caliph, Uthman, uh, may God be pleased with him, said that now Islam has spread all over the world and we need, by that time it was in China and the Russian republics and, and in, in Europe and Southern Asia, he said we need to send copies of this. So he again called Zaid bin Thabit, the same person, said now you write from that original. So they made six codices, they're called Uthmanic codices. So every Quran that has, if you look in the back, it says this is from the Uthmanic codice. So they made copies of that, of course, they weren't any printing presses, they wrote it and they were bound in books and at least two of those are still present. And I'll show you a picture of one that is in the Topkapi Museum in, in uh, Istanbul and there is one in Tashkent in a museum there. So that's how uh, the Quran was preserved. <coughs> this is one of those early manuscripts in, from the first century of Islam, at the time of what we call the first generation of the companions of the Prophet. And this is in a special, what we would call today a font, which is called the Kufic, uh, in which there were no marks, no dots, no, no punctuation marks, because they were such masters of the language, they could read this. Now you can bring today's experts, they would have trouble reading this. So as Islam spread, within the next 60 years, uh, the caliphs commissioned people to put punctuation marks so that it would be read correctly, but going by how it was recited, and also to put dots so that people who were not of, or of Arab origin could, would read it correctly. So in three phases, those things were done. And now latest, now they've color-coded those so that people can recite those in the right way. But the scripture is the same. And this is another one of the early ones. And this is from 1307, uh, the next one. This is actually right now in display at the Metropolitan Museum in uh, New York, if for those who want to go and see it. Uh, so you see how the writing has changed somewhat, and these marks have appeared, just to make the pronunciation correct so people don't recite it incorrectly. <coughs> Now, just to give you a flavor of the Quran so that this is not just an academic discourse, I'm just going to go over some uh, major themes and then some selections from the Quran. So, <clears throat> the most important themes are the, the absolute unity of God. That's the single most important thing. A third of the Quran is that. Attributes and names of God, that this is who God is, not what people imagine him or claim him to be. Talks about 
what's coming ahead. These are not things that science can discover. Resurrection in the afterlife, unseen creations like angels. And in the Quran, there are stories of previous nations like Pharaoh and Moses and Noah and, and Jesus and, and uh, David and Solomon and all of those are mentioned in the Quran as lessons that look, this is what our messengers came with, this is how they were treated, but look in the end who prospers, who succeeds. That there are lessons for all of us. And there are legal rulings and injunctions, which is what our legal system or Sharia is. And then there are certain scientific facts in the Quran. This is not a book of science, but what God alluded to, and we will go over some of those. And it tells us of the future events to come. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was asked, what, is, what are your miracles? Every prophet has a miracle, you know. He said, he was told, your miracle is a living miracle. The Quran itself is a miracle. The miracle itself is the book, and the people of the language understood it, and God made some challenges in it, and then he put certain things in it, the scientific miracles that we are going to go over. Okay, so we'll, we'll start here now. <clears throat> Read this verse. Have those who disbelieve not seen by the knowledge they acquired that the heavens and the earth were conjoined as one mass? Then we separated them, and we made every living thing from water, that everything was one mass. That is the theory of singularity and the Big Bang. This is what scientists have come up with now in the last 60 years. And this is what the Quran says 1,450 years ago. And now what do they tell us? That if you take your whole bodies, how, what percentage of your body is water? More than 60%. He says, we made everything from water. And everything is, is from water. So this is a reference to how this creation took place. Let's go to the next one. Now behold the heavens. We have built it with mighty hands. And it is we alone who expand and make it spread out. This is the theory today of the cosmic expansion that this is growing. And that's what the Quran said 1450 years ago. And what's going to come in the end? It says, on the day when we shall roll up the skies as a scribe rolls up the scrolls, then just as we began the first creation, we shall once more bring it forth. It's a promise binding upon us. Indeed, we are able to perform it. And then God talks about what's going to happen when the sun is shrouded in darkness and when the stars lose their light and when the mountains are made to vanish and the seas boil over and the sky is torn away and the sun and moon are united. That is the current theory of the big crunch that everything will come back. So there are references in the Quran to this. Back to singularity. Some other things, again, <clears throat> till we came up with ultrasounds and, uh, and uh, technologies to see what was going on in the womb, we didn't know how the fetus developed. Well, here's a verse from 1450 years ago. Verily, we created man from a product of wet earth, that's the origin of Adam, then placed him as a drop of seed in a safe lodging, that's the womb, then we fashioned from the drop a leech like suspended clot. That's the first stage. Then we fashion the clot into a little chewed like lump. If you look at photomicrographs of those, that looks exactly like gum that's been chewed. Then we fashion into the little lump bones, then clothed the bones with flesh, and then produced it as another creation. So blessed be Allah, God, the best of creators. So the, the facts of embryology were already told to us, of which we now know. Just give you a few more. Here's a verse. It's talking about the state of the disbelievers who rejected the message. It's like the veils of darkness, and God gives this example. 
in a vast deep ocean, overwhelmed with waves topped by waves, above which are dark clouds, means depths of darkness, one above another. If one stretches out his hand, he can hardly see it. For anyone to whom God does not provide light, there is no light. So here it's talking about waves upon waves in the ocean. And that there is in the ocean places where if you stretch out your hand, you cannot see. And that's at a thousand meters underwater. And there are only special submarines that are now developed who can go down there and say there is absolute pitch darkness. And guess what? They have found that there are internal waves at every density level which are just like the waves on the surface underwater. And that's what the Quran says. At a time where they couldn't dive more than 30 meters because they had no equipment. So those are some of the scientific miracles of the Quran. And then the Quran, God challenged those Arabs for the linguistic skills. He says, if you say this is invented, produce a single chapter that you can judge to be equivalent or equal in quality to the Quran. And the smallest chapter of the Quran only has less than 12 words. So they took up the challenge and they brought all of they brought the greatest poets of the time together. They said, whatever you want. They said, he said, I'm going to be away from my family. I need supplies for them for a year. I'm, I need these books. I need these books. After six months, they went to him. He said, ma hadha qal al-bashar. These are not the, what you want me to compete with. These are not the words of man. Until today, the challenge is open. That you produce a Quran that linguistically matches the majesty of these and you be the judge. So that's what the Quran is. So we go to some of the selections of the Quran and we of course start with the oneness of God. This is an entire chapter of the Quran is this number towards the end of the Quran which is chapter uh, 112. Say and he's telling the Prophet Muhammad that this is information for you, but I'm ordering you to go and say to them, proclaim what? He is Allah. He is God. Means everyone knows there's a creator. He is God, one. The everlasting refuge be sought by all. He does not beget, nor is he begotten. He is separate from his creation. Everything else is his creation. And there is none comparable to him in any way. Very, very important. We can't give human forms to him. And then he says in the second verse, He is the sole creator of the heavens and earth. He alone has made for you pairs of yourself and of cattle. And he multiplies you. And there is nothing that is anything like even his likeness. And he is the all-hearing and all-seeing. Then God makes an argument, had there been in heaven or earth gods besides Allah, besides God, then most surely both the heavens and the earth would have been disordered and corrupted by competing deities. As you know, in Greek mythology and Hindu mythology, there are multiple gods. And if you read the mythologies, they are always at war with each other. That's what he says, that if truly there were, there would be wars in the universe going on. few verses about the day of judgment God says how then shall it be when we gather them all together to a day of which there is no doubt and this comes frequently a day of which there is no doubt certainty when every soul will be paid in full what it has earned and they will not be wronged in the least thus the hour of doom will come there is no doubt thereof and God will raise those who are in the graves for reckoning Mention of paradise and hell, God says, and as for those who believe and do good works, we shall make them enter gardens underneath which rivers flow to dwell therein forever. And indeed, those who disbelieve and die in disbelief, even the entire earth full of gold shall not be accepted from such a one if it were offered as a ransom to save his soul. It is these for whom there is a painful punishment and they will have no helpers. 
So this is the real race and competition that we have, is to race for paradise and to protect ourselves from the hellfire. A few verses about the Prophet Muhammad himself. It says, Muhammad is not the natural father of any man among you, but he is the messenger of God and the seal of prophets, the final prophet, and God is all aware of all things. And we have sent you, O prophet, not other than as a mercy for all the people of the worlds. And we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as the bringer of good tidings and a forewarner unto all mankind, but most of mankind know not. So the prophet Muhammad came to save people from the hellfire, guide them to the right way, show them the way to God's pleasure and to success in this life and in the hereafter. He was not seeking kingdoms. He was not seeking wealth. He lived the most simple, frugal life. His pillow was made of date palm. His, his mattress was a skin of a camel. And when he left, the, the night he died, there wasn't enough oil to burn a lamp in his house. A lot of wealth came, but it went, given to the poor and needy. He didn't want kingdom. He didn't want wealth. So it wasn't somebody looking for position. And God tells us the purpose for which we are created in the Quran. He says, I have not created jinn, which is an unseen creation, like the angels, and men for any other purpose but to know and worship me. And then God tells us about, ultimately, it's all a state of the heart. That that's where faith is. That on the day, the day of judgment, when neither wealth nor sons will avail. This is what we all take pride in. This is how much I have. This is my human resources. This is my natural resources. God says on that day, nothing will avail you. Only a sound heart, a pristine heart, a pure heart that has no corruption in it. That is the state of success. And then God mentions about death in this verse. He says, every soul shall taste of death and only on the day of judgment shall you be paid your full recompense that there is not always justice in this world. That is on for the day of judgment. Only he who is saved far from the fire of hell and admitted to the garden of paradise will have attained the object of life. For the life of this world is truly but delusional enjoyment and goods of deception that we are deceived by, it, and it goes like that. You know, those of us who are getting old, it looks like our whole lives have gone by. And there's a verse in the Quran that Noah, who lived more than 900 years, would be asked on the Day of Judgment, how long did you stay on earth? And he will say, a day or part of a day. That's how it will seem. So we have to know the true nature of this world, that it's very critical for the eternal life that's coming. And of course, the Prophet Muhammad did not come to force this faith down anybody's throat. And these are some of the verses of religious freedom in the Quran. There shall be no compulsion in religion. The truth and right direction is henceforth distinct from falsehood and error. They are very, they are miles apart. People can choose. And he who rejects false deities and believes in God has grasped a firm handhold which will never break. And God is the all-hearer and all-knower. And he says, we are best aware of what they say, and you, Muhammad, are in no way a compeller over them. Therefore, but warn with this Quran all those who fear my threat of punishment. So the freedom of choice of faith is guaranteed in the Sharia, the, the divine law itself. Here are a few more verses. Indeed, we have revealed unto you, O Muhammad, the scripture for mankind for, with truth. Then whoever is guided by it, it is for the good of his own soul. And whoever goes astray, strays only to his own loss. And you are not a guardian over them. And we can go to a few other verses. Just to give you an expanse of what the, the Quran covers, the treatment of parents, the rights of everyone, the rights of children, the rights of parents, the rights of the spouse, the rights of neighbors. So here's a verse about the parents. 
Your Lord has decreed that you worship none except him. That's the most important. And the next thing, within the same verse, he attaches the importance, and you be kind to your parents. That's the status of the parents. And then God gives us the scenario of an old, demented parent that you are busy and have no time for and has become very stubborn and unreasonable. God says, if one of them or both of them attain old age with thee, say not to them the slightest word of impatience, nor repulse them, but speak to them with a gracious word. Justice is stressed in the Quran over and over again. God says, and act equitably. Indeed, God loves the equitable. And all you who believe, be firm in justice, witnesses for God, even though if it be against yourselves or your parents or your kindred, whether the case be of a rich man or a poor man, for God is nearer to both than you are. So follow not passion, lest you lapse from truth. And if you lapse or fall away, then lo, God is ever informed of that which you do. And similarly, God tells us in the next verse, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. Then God tells us about races and tells us about what is true superiority in this verse that is frequently quoted. O oh, mankind, indeed, we have created you all from a single male and female and have made you into nations and tribes that you may come to know one another. Indeed, the noblest of you in the sight of God is the most God-fearing of you, the best in conduct, and God is all-knowing and all-aware. That superiority is not by wealth or race or color or anything else. It is by your righteousness, your piety, your consciousness of God. And then God gives us a formula of what we are all looking for, peace and tranquility and happiness, that God is the source of all peace and he is the source of all happiness. So he says, those who have truly believed and whose hearts grow calm with assurance in the remembrance of God, most certainly it is in the remembrance of God that hearts find peaceful tranquility and calmness. So whoever is disconnected from God, no matter what they have, will not find ha true happiness and peace. A few verses about our prophet and messenger of God, Jesus, who is like the brother of all other prophets, like Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This is verses about the birth of Jesus. It says, Behold, the angel said, O Mary, God gives you the glad tidings of a word from him, whose name is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, eminent in this world and in the hereafter, and one of those brought near to God. He will speak to mankind in his cradle, this was one of the miracles of Jesus, and in his manhood, and he is of the righteous. She said, My Lord, how can I have a child when no human being has touched me? He said, So shall it be. God creates whatever he so wills. When he decrees a matter, he only says unto it, Be, and so it is. And then he gives another example. He says, Indeed, the likeness of the creation of Jesus with respect to God is as the likeness of Adam. He created him from dust. Then he said unto him, be, and he was, no parents. So God does what he does. Then God gives in the Quran a special status to the people of the book, which are the Jews and the Christians. And they are, these are some of the verses. Call to the path of your Lord with wisdom and fair exhortation and reason with them in the best way. Indeed, your Lord alone is best aware of all those who strayed from the right path, and he is best aware of those who are rightly guided. Then he says, O believers, you shall not argue with the people of the scripture in matters of faith unless it be in the fairest way, except with those of them who do wrong to you out of hostility. Rather say to them, we believe in the Quran which has been revealed to us and in the scripture that has been revealed to you. Our God and your God is one and to him we surrender as Muslims in willing submission. And another similar verse, say, O Muhammad, O people of the scripture, come to an agreement between us and you that we shall worship none other than God and that we shall ascribe no partners unto him in worship and that none of us shall take others as Lord beside God. Yet if they turn away, then, O believers, say to them, bear witness that we are indeed Muslims in willing submission and surrender to that one God alone. 
and we worship none others. And finally, <clears throat> in conclusion, what is the role of the Quran in the life of a Muslim? This book has changed the life of millions and billions of people. There are about 1.4 billion people. There are people who read this book every day. It's not something